Okay, good. Well, let's get going, folks. I'm sure there'll be some latecomers. So, um, a very warm welcome. Thank you very much. Welcome in, in Zoom again. Whatever they have, put the aircon down. Um, uh, very glad that uh, you guys have made it and very grateful to everybody who is uh, contributing to the session. Uh, we decided to do this session uh, for a number of reasons. Um, and um, the, the, the way the session is going to work is we're going to get uh, some research inputs. And then in the afternoon, and some, some guest speakers in the afternoon, we're going to have some discussion with you guys. And hopefully, you all got a piece of paper with some questions on them, which we would like you all to consider and, and write on the back uh, your answers, please. Um, I just want to show you that um, our guest speaker has changed. It was originally going to be Joy Schumacher Gillimore from the WMOWHO, but she's come down with COVID, ironically, and is not well. And um, Madeline Thompson, Professor Madeline Thompson, has uh, kindly agreed to uh, step into the breach. And she's only going to talk for 20 minutes, so it's a 40 minute slot. So what we did was we asked um, Joannette, who was uh, all the way through the process, somewhere between a post and a paper, we couldn't figure it out. So she's agreed to present her, her work uh, in that extra 20 minutes that we've got to remove her from uh, what we think was a poster into a presentation. Um, and um, also I want to tell you that uh, Madeline Thompson is keen to talk today because Today is the day that are launching a new form for research proposal from the Wellcome Trust. So she's actually going to launch that in our session. And that's really valuable. It's a very well resourced uh, uh, center of funding for climate and health uh, issues, apart from the fact that, of course, she's a world expert. So that's great for us. Um, those are the questions. And what I will do later in the session is talk about this idea of the Research Alliance on Climate and Health. But ultimately, what we're here to do is to, is to look at uh, this idea of, well, first of all, to hear about the range of research that's ongoing. We have uh, research from all over uh, the country, and in fact, even from Japan, uh, pertaining to South Africa. Uh, so we have guests from Japan, uh, Patrick, and Michael's sort of a half guest from Japan, because he's actually South African, but doing his PhD in Japan. Um, and then we want to host a discussion on the establishment of this idea and see what, what support there is and potentially take away a mandate from this group to do so. Um, and then we have a, a, a panel discussion to reflect on this. And we've got uh, Orno uh, from DOH, Michelle from the NICD, Atlevo from Source, and uh, Tandi from the MRC. Um, and, and that's what we'll, we'll do. We'll be hoping to finish by that. Five thirty. We'll see how we look up. Make it, make it quite, quite relaxed. The world. I'm just going to keep the time up. Uh, and then just to say that uh, the idea of reach really stems out of uh, work that we've all been doing together for a long time on climate and health, but also out of the government's um, uh, national Pronounced climate service, which is a process. Tim Lamaro is here from the department. He's with us today. Thanks for coming. And that's really one of the key elements of that is the user interface platform. And what, what we're thinking about is the idea that this idea of a research alliance, which I'll explain later, really can contribute to, to that process. And we'll talk about that later. So now we'll go to the program. And I'm delighted to welcome Tony Wright from MRC. Uh, I, I know you all know her well. Um, uh, Currently is one of the most prolific and energetic researchers in the community. Uh, and recently, with co authors published a very important paper, kind of a peg in the sand, looking at, at, at what uh, the considerations are uh, for climate and health and climate change. And I'm very glad that she's uh, agreed to talk. So, currently, I'm going to give you the floor. Thank you very much. And I'm going to the slides. Yes. Hi everybody, thanks for joining this session. Um, 
It's uh, great to see familiar faces and new ones. I look forward to meeting everybody afterwards. Um, so what I'd like to be able to do today is convince you that we do have enough evidence to know that climate change is impacting health in South Africa and in some instances in Africa as well. So I'm going to do, um, I'm going to take you on a journey and hope that by the end of this presentation, you'll be convinced that we really do need to be doing more. And I'll give some ideas of how, what we might be wanting to do. So um, this talk is based on a, a manuscript that was published in 2021. I acknowledge the co-authors of that manuscript who gave me input, and the reference is right at the end of the presentation. So I'll leave that slide up then. So by way of an interview, I'm going to first give a little bit of a global perspective. I'm very short. I wasn't sure who was going to speak before me, so I'll do that. And then give two slides from the African perspective, just really focusing on the assessment report six of the IPCC. And then South Africa focusing entirely on our health impacts from climate change, some research needs and some policy gaps. So if we start with the global context, the most eminent report that came out to give us a perspective on global climate change and health impacts are the findings of the 2022 report of the Lancet Council Countdown, Tracking Progress on Health and Climate Change. And there were some very astounding um, figures put forward. In fact, if you go and have a look at their website, they have fantastic visualizations, a plot with every one or two line um, comments from this report. They've really made it a lot more digestible. You don't have to download the whole PDF. So they make a note that extreme heat waves in 2010 were associated with 98 million more people suffering from food insecurity than every year of 1981 to 2010. They say that heat exposure led to 470 billion potential labor hours lost globally in 2021. And that life-threatening extreme weather events are becoming increasingly more frequent and weather conditions are becoming more suitable for the spread of infectious disease. And this is an example of one of those infographics that they created. I've just picked this one. It's looking at people who are vulnerable um, and those are typically infants, children, the elderly, people with comorbidities, people on chronic medication, and they're saying, based on the data that's been gathered for the different WHO, the World Health Organization meetings, that people from vulnerable groups were exposed to 3.7 billion more heat wave days in 2021. And this is taking it at the individual level. So it's every person who has been a day. That's why that number seems more than the number of days in a year. Mm -hmm. um, then annually in the 1981, 1986 to 2005 period. And just in case you're interested, the graph on the left is looking at it according to the Human Development Index. And um, it's looking at the change in person days over time in terms of this vulnerability to heat waves. So we can see that they're all increasing um, across the development index <laughs> parameters. Then if we turn to what is a very complex figure, and I'm not showing this to, to you today to be able to understand it, I'm just letting you know that this is in the IPCC uh, Africa chapter of the assessment report six. It took a team of us uh, several months to try and put this figure together, as well as the next one, which I, I think will be a little bit more digestible. But essentially here, yeah, what we're looking at is a summary of confidence of the direct direction of projected change in climatic impact drivers in Africa. So the drivers are across the top, um, heat and cold is the first, and wet and dry, and so on. And the colors indicate the confidence. Red is not so confident, and blue is high confidence. And the dots indicate whether we've already seen these impacts affecting um, the country. So the black dots have already, it's showing it's already emerged in the historical period with the medium to high confidence. And so all the black dots are sitting there in the heat and cold. Um, climate drivers for mean air temperature, extreme heat, cold as well. If you don't have enough information for, for sun, this is about like the frost layers and everything. And then the numbers are almost a key for the numbers underneath where there may be additional information. So it's a very, very rich uh, table. And I'm not going to go through it anymore other than to say that it's available if you're interested in it. 
But what was more impressive and what I'm really pleased about is that the um, very, very first burning embers diagram, which is typical of IPCC, was produced for Africa. And this is the first time it's ever been made. Um, again, this took several people, months of energy and work and arguing to decide where the gradation of color would change at what degree Celsius and what level of confidence we could assign. And in fact, it was even difficult to argue which things we should put onto this burning in the diagram because you know you have to have enough either information or expert opinion to be able to create one of these. So um, the one that I'm most interested in is the one in the middle. So this is looking at mortality and morbidity from heat and infectious disease. And you might argue, well, why have those two been put together? Because should you want to know them apart? But in fact, it's actually quite integrate, integrately um, connected. And it was very difficult to argue to put the two on each on their own M1. Um, so essentially, we are looking at how global mean temperature increase over pre-industrial um, times. Uh, is going to affect mortality and mobility and heat and infectious disease. And we see that we've already had change. The red line is the current um, global mean temperature change. And there's just the front page of the report, and it is uh, publicly available. So then I'll turn to the impacts of climate change on um, health in South Africa. And all of this is drawn from evidence um, through a systematic a quasi systematic review that we published, as I mentioned. So, I'm going to look at increase in ambient temperature, increase in hot days, heat waves, intensity and frequency, heavy rainfall, flooding, drought, air pollution, and then something that I'm most interested in at the moment has been around dust storms um, because of the work that we do in our research team on air quality. So, temperature. Um, is probably our most pressing concern. I spent the last five days talking to several journalists and with them interviews about the heat waves that have been experienced across the parts of South Africa in the month of January, most notably the death of the alpha workers of the Northern Cape. And some of this work uh, that's been published in terms of the research suggesting that parts of South Africa are experiencing, uh, that we're experiencing less and 20 heat wave events per year in the current climate are actually projected to experience more than 40 of these by the end of this century. And this corroborates other work that we've done when we looked at the number of hot days projected into the future. And the number of hot days, in fact, starts to creep into all four seasons of the year, not just the summer seasons. So what are the health impacts that we are concerned about? Well, we, we know that the workers in the Northern Cape um, re uh, reportedly uh, were admitted and uh, unfortunately passed away as a consequence of heat stroke and the associated um, uh, health effects of heat stroke. But heat exhaustion and heat stress are probably the two things that are most pressing for, for people who are not outdoor workers. They are very special, they're vulnerable group. I'll mention a little bit more about them in, in a moment. But these things increase respiratory disease, cardiovascular disease, and renal diseases, and kidney-related diseases, as well as mental disorders. And on the mental disorder side, we've done some work to explore how uh, heat increases violence, especially in low-income settle settlements. And that study that we did was, in fact, in Kyrgyzstan in the UK. And then another massive concern, which is more of an indirect impact of climate change in health, is that temperature causes a deterioration in the quality and quantity of food. Um, I could also talk about water, obviously that's a natural one we're concerned about water and droughts. But in terms of food, grains, vegetables, and meat, um, the growing of those becomes a challenge. And then especially um, uh, what we have seeing at the moment that's compounded by our electricity situation is the concerns around food state. And um, this is because of a lack of continuous cold, cold chain um, supply. And, um, and as temperatures increase, we're going to have to make sure that these supplies can keep the temperatures at the optimal temperature to avoid um, contamination. And of course, malnutrition is our concern there. 
I mentioned outdoor workers as a very vulnerable group. We've seen the impacts of this now. It's anecdotal to the media. It's very, very difficult to get this information from hospital. Uh, usually the underlying causes, not necessarily heat stroke, are used as the cause of death on the person's certificate. But it's linked with the day where it's been very hot, with the preceding days being very hot. So the, the hospital reports it as such in the media, but we don't see it on a death certificate which is a real problem. And it's something we have to educate our healthcare professionals about going forward in the future. So in South Africa, we have a very large outdoor worker population, forestry and conservation, agriculture and construction. Um, this is a study, I'm not gonna go through it all in detail. It's just essentially to say that there is very old work in South Africa to show that an increase in temperature, outdoor miners in this case, led to an increase in um, the uh, I'm trying to see number of deaths, um, that this is very old work, and there has been no study done since then. This is a research gap, and I haven't got this latest statistics here. We don't know what the impacts are um, on outdoor workers in South Africa, and it hasn't been projected for the future. It's not a difficult study to do. I think we could do that. So some of the measures to protect the health of workers. And this is a challenge because the worker is, is, um, relies on their employer. And if the employer is telling them to wear these very thick overalls and no, don't wear a hat because it's going to get caught in some equipment, it is a big challenge um, to try and keep people cool. So they really need to look at adequate rest periods, adequate clothing and headgear, sunscreen if they have uh, lightly pigmented skin. And to avoid working in the hottest part of the day. And we really need to flip our minds on this because working for water can clear the waterways in the Western Cape. All start work in the early hours of the morning and they stop by midday. So we are doing this. The same with construction workers on roads. In Japan, they do most of their road repair work at night when it's much cooler. And so this is really something that we have to change our thinking in South Africa. Then temperature rise and vulnerability. I've mentioned who the vulnerable groups are in South Africa. And um, the other, the one that I mentioned was uh, people with exist, pre-existing disease. We have a big concern about people living with HIV AIDS, not just in terms of access to the services that they need, which aren't always available, for example, clean drinking water to stay hydrated, but access to their uh, medications. And you might think this is a weird thing to talk about, but when it's extremely hot, it's very unlikely someone's willing to make a long walk to go on the specific day set for them to, to get their um, ARPTs. So in times of heat stress, we really need to think about reduced access to medical care, restricted drug, drug supplies, and non-adherence to dose regimes um, that may occur. And then the other thing that we've done very, very little um, on in South Africa is understanding the impact of heat on birth outcomes. So we have very good evidence globally that heat does cause um, congenital birth defects due to exposure of the mum when they're in the first four to six weeks of their pregnancy. But we do not know anything about this uh, yet in South Africa. That's another large research gap. Then I'll move to infectious disease. So some of the, the work that's been done in South Africa is it's actually most progressive in the malaria uh, world. I know Nard is giving a talk, somebody else is giving a talk on malaria today. So triglycinates generally highest in the wet summer months. The conditions that favor both the onset of protozoa plus the frequency of biting and feeding. Um, the local transmission in by mosquitoes occurs usually in low-lying areas, in the Kwazulu Natal, in Malaga, and the Popo. And this is where a large portion of our population reside putting a lot of people at risk. And most of these uh, projection works, the modeling is showing us that in future years, we're going to see an increase in malaria, as well as the potential shift in where these uh, malaria areas are. And this shift could be from the west to the south, as well as east, eastern parts, and even a possible spread to the high parts. And then we, we mustn't forget about some of these other infectious diseases that up until now are either relatively uncommon, infrequently occurring in South Africa. But in the changing climate with changing temperature and, and precipitation patterns, we could very likely start to see 
and increase them. I'm not going to go through all of them. You can see what they are, dengue, red fever, fever, west of Nile virus, tick-borne diseases, and schistosomiasis. But essentially, what's the challenge here is that nurses and doctors working in clinics and hospitals may not have seen these things for a very long time. And so when somebody presents with this, they aren't necessarily going to identify the symptoms and realize what the issue is because they haven't seen it before or in a very long time. And so we have an enormous gap in making sure that our healthcare professionals are up to date in what could potentially be coming based on the threat of climate change in terms of health. Then I think we've already heard, I, I didn't hear Franz was talk, I saw the title, I'm very pleased to see the slides, but we have had some ridiculously large rainfall events in South Africa in recent years. So we know in South Africa rainfall is typically variable in time and space, but we've had these dramatically large rainfall events, whether from uh, the uh, of the cyclone type things or intense cutoff lows or whatever the causes, these impacts seem to be increasing with intensity and frequency. Um, for example, in the Northern Cape. And at the same time, it's so confusing because we're seeing a decrease uh, in precipitation in other places with the persistent drought, for example, in the Eastern Cape. Uh, we mustn't underestimate the potential of water and what it can do. So we have seen a cholera outbreak because of a uh, flash flooding that occurred in the city of Johannesburg a few years ago. And this actually was because of poor sanitation. So this is where the interconnectedness of our services and systems, which are usually not working to optimal standards, leads to deterioration of the system and places people at risk. So very quickly, the lack of good sanitation in a settlement can spread a cholera um, outbreak. High rainfall also affects agricultural productivity as well as the cost of sustainable foods. I don't know if anyone's looked at the price of the cauliflower lately. It's sometimes in the, in the order of 50 rand, which is me when I put it back. <laughs> mad. And when these extreme rainfall events such as heavy rain, flooding and flash floods will increase in South Africa is uncertain, but thought to be likely. And I think as public as a public health professional, I very much like the climate scientists to be able to give us more information on this. It's not adequate on the day of a very heavy rainfall event to suddenly implement disaster risk management and preparedness in the health system. You know, we, we can't be functioning like this. We need to know well in advance so we can prepare. We flip this over to look at drought. So South Africa's got a very strange type of drought. It's almost creeping. Um, it starts with a significant initial, without a significant initial event, but then intensifies. We saw this in uh, Cape Town and has a tremendous impact on multiple dimensions of health and society. Not only just malnutrition because of reduced uh, food availability and production, but also the risk of diarrheal disease, which unfortunately still remains one of the top five reasons that children under five in South Africa pass away. Following this, uh, the extended drought in KwaZulu Natal between 2015 and 2016 is a study that has now shown that we saw stunting among children in, um, in certain parts of KwaZulu Natal. And this was due to an increased risk of food security. We need more of these sorts of studies to be able to motivate and lobby for that preparedness that I was talking about. Um, I know drought is difficult to prepare for, but there should be things that we activate um, when we know that it's either coming or um, it's happening. And then the last one is extreme weather events. So dust storms are not... Uh, regularly monitored in South Africa. There's no repository where we can go and look to see when dust, occur, dust storms occur and where. This is a really big challenge. Many countries around the world have this information and we can then do studies to look at the health impacts of those dust storms in terms of air pollution exposure on those communities. 
So the way we do this is instead to use the media and photographs and Twitter um, and the magazines, for example, to capture the timings of these gas flows and try and put this together with uh, air quality and temperature data to estimate the impacts that it might have on, on health. So obviously the, the, the most prominent challenge in the dust storm situation is the lack of visibility. So we know that there's an increase in motor vehicle injuries. And then we have an increase of exposure to microorganisms, pollens, and obviously your particulate matters, which can contain toxic metals. And dust storms have been associated in other countries. So we assume the same would be true here. We just don't have evidence of increased hospital admissions due to a variety of different uh, reasons. Um, some as severe as myocardial infarction or heart attack um, and arrhythmias. And others less serious but definitely debilitating such as conjunctivitis. And again, vulnerable people are, are really at risk of this. And why, why, when I talk about vulnerable people, when you say infants, children and the elderly, they rely on caregivers to look after them, to act on their behalf, to protect their health and well-being. And if they aren't informed, and they don't do anything to try and keep, for example, dust out of a, a, a home for the elderly, then, then the risk is to that person, and they haven't had the opportunity to cope or um, will be able to reduce the risk. And the last one, which I'm adding in, which I didn't put at the beginning, is, is one that I'm, I'm interested in, and I think there's a lot of, of work that still needs to be done. I know we've got Christian in the room who's working on air pollution and temperature, for example. But the interlinkages between climate change and air pollution are a huge concern in South Africa, mainly because we have a big air pollution problem. We have three air pollution priority areas where the air quality is way above the South African national standards and even further above the World Health Organization guidelines. This means that we've got large numbers of South Africans at risk of air pollution. And in a changing climate, we are not sure how this is going to pan out, especially in terms of pollutants like ozone. Altered emissions and meteorological factors will influence air quality, as well as change human behavior that affects exposure to air quality. So this means in the instance that we're seeing a much colder winter, people then tend to burn more coal or wood to try and keep warm because it's the cheapest way of doing it and put themselves at risk of exposure to those toxic pollutants. So the uh, bit of work that's been published a few years ago under a business as usual scenario of climate change, it has been projected that changes in meteorology alone over South Africa will lead to an increase in PM2.5, very small particles that can penetrate very deeply into the lungs. So we really do need more work in this area to quantify potential changes in emissions, both natural and anthropogenic, and the natural are the challenge. Sitting in the um, World Health Organization Air Quality Guideline meetings, there were representatives from um, uh, West Africa, so the parts of the Middle East. And between the, us representing Africa and them, there was a big fight between us and Europe and America, because the concentrations at which they're uh, what they're dealing with is nothing like what we're dealing with in Africa. And most of it's actually just the background concentration from dusty roads, uh, dusty grasslands, unpaved roads, and so on. It's a real challenge um, facing us going forward. So this is a very simple um, thought of thinking process. I've given you a number of other ones to ponder on. Some of our research needs and policy gaps. So. We have to find creative ways to get hold of health data and conduct as large a study as possible to support evidence-based decision-making. Now is not the time for cross-sectional studies in epidemiology anymore in South Africa. Now is the time for the big studies. And there is data out there. We have to just find it. Sometimes it takes a lot of effort, but it's possible. I don't think we should underestimate the climate impacts on mental health. In a country where we are plagued with violence, um, I think that the concerns around climate change and temperature increase on mental health 
are not being given enough consideration. And then, if anything, we have to come up with these efficacious adaptation interventions to prevent loss of life. And by that, I mean not only thinking about the simple solutions in homes that can help reduce cook stove emissions, but we need those big ideas, probably the more costly ones, which require more people to implement disaster risk management before um, any occurrence of some kind of disaster. On the policy gap side, we have some really good documents. Some of them are not out yet. The National Climate Change and Health Adaptation Plan number two is, um, I think, waiting for approval, but should be out this year. The problem with that plan is that it hasn't been translated into a work plan. So if you look at the, when it does come out, if you look at the back of the plan, you will see a list of tasks that have been assigned to each of the activities and the goals. And the government does not have the energy or the capacity or the ability to do all of those things. And I encourage everybody, whether you're a researcher or an NGO, or somebody working with data, go and look at those and see what role can you play in trying to answer some of those questions. We took one of those on, um, the Medical Research Council, in the previous plan, the first plan, there was a call in that work plan to ask for a risk and vulnerability assessment tool for heat in towns of South Africa. So we took that as a research project and um, it didn't cost that much money. It was some engagement with stakeholders. We used Rustenburg local municipality and came up with a tool, which is a South African tool that any, any local municipality or town can use. We got publication out of it, but a really cool tool that government can now use. And that was just taking the initiative, looking at what has been considered important to do. Implementing these plans requires us to be part of that. We cannot rely purely on governments to do the implementation. The same is true for the National Heat Health Action Guidelines, which were published late last year. Those are also available online. I really recommend you go and have a look at those. I'm still not sure what the health uh, care system is going to do in a changing climate. If anyone sat in a, a waiting room, I think my last slide got this picture, a waiting room in the Popo, temperature can reach 40, 42 degrees Celsius. If you're sitting on benches, there's no fans, there's no ventilation, and there's hundreds of mums and their babies and it's hot. Most of those babies are wrapped in blankets when they really shouldn't be. They should just be in a very light clothing. I don't know how we are going to handle that. It's an intrinsic problem rather than a simple one for solving. And the last two, adequate financing, a huge challenge. And how do we integrate action across not only the different department sectors, but also across the different levels of government. So in conclusion, many of the existing health stresses in South Africa will be impacted adversely by climate change, although we don't have enough information to know by how much. That's work that needs to be done. Whether the changes in climate will result in severe health issues for South Africa will depend largely on better living and socioeconomic conditions for all South Africans according to our NDP. An adequate education for personal protective behavior, better control, and ready access to medical care and treatment will also be really important. And there's the picture of the waiting room. It's, it's really cool. So that's the reference to the article, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thanks. Thank you, Tori. Thank you. If only one microphone, there is another microphone. You need a, if you want to talk, Thank you. Um, okay, so Cody, thanks very much. I'm just going to pick on a few notes that I made now on the open floor. We've got a few minutes. So, uh, firstly, um, the link between extreme events and health. Um, and, and yesterday was interesting as we had a session on extreme events, and it was noted that there was hardly anything about drought. And there were, and so in my mind, I'm distinguishing between I think what you call extreme weather events. And extreme climate events. So the weather events are these sudden 
days, hours, uh, events, um, as opposed to say a drought, which is a seasonal or multi-year process. So that's a very important thread to draw out of that and the connection between those. Um, the 2015-16 uh, drought in, in KZN was an El Nino event. And so the role of global climate flows is also very, very important. And then I wanted to say something about dust only, and that was um, that we also had a presentation from Jimmy Alibote yesterday, and he was speaking about dust, in particular in West Africa, where there's the seasonal sort of configurations bring dust in, and as you were saying, many people are accustomed to it, but it's a, a massive health issue. So there are no questions in that, but are just my, my comments, uh, but if you wanted to uh, respond to that, that's good. And then I'm going to say that you'll participate in the her talk. And um, I, I mean, I'm bagging this drama on reach, which I hope would be something that would address those points that you made at the end, Kobe, uh, especially in organizing the research community around some of that policy that already exists, and potentially bringing together a range of different partners to give effect to what you're looking at. Okay. Yeah, so, so I can comment on the REACH idea. I think that what's currently happening in South Africa is that we are potentially creating duplication of work because we don't know what each other's doing, and, um, and that's really wasteful. Uh, if we were to work more closely together, we could actually energize bigger action, which would be much more powerful in terms of the evidence that we need to lobby for change. Thank you. Okay, so to the floor, please. Any comments or questions for Kariti? I've got Dini, Malebo, Wanjuro, Plow. Okay, we're going to start with two because we have the most seen. Do you want to take the mic? Please? I promise I can answer all of them. I'm not all nervous. Um, Presentation. Um, a, a quick one for me might be a good for thought, a question, or even a comment on how can we really take some of the things forward. The issue of uh, direct attribution and the capacity of the health sector or the Department of Health to be able to collect data that attribute certain type of diseases with climate change from their facilities and our ability to also assess what that does to the economy, the budgetary implication in relation to the contribution uh, to, um, to GDP contribution uh, to the health sector. You know, I think it's something that we really need to think through on your engagement Are you able to see uh, the type of attribution and the facilities in terms of that uh, that is being collected and, and recorded on some area of work that might require the attention. Yeah. And that's an absolutely wonderful question and comment. So there's two parts that I can say to answer that. The first is that working with the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment and the National Department of Health for the last year, we've been trying to come up with indicators. So the DHIS information at the moment is not adequate. Um, originally, the idea for climate change and health indicators was to just use what's available. Um, basically, that's very little. We could use diarrhea and under fives, maybe, and maybe lower respiratory tract infections and under five. That's not enough. So um, we've been lobbying very hard to get uh, indicators, and this is a joint engagement between those departments, obviously. So I'm hoping those will come online this year. Um, we've been using the other data, but it's not it's not enough. So that's the one thing. And the other one is in terms of the attribution, detection and attribution work, the best database we have at the moment to do that is our mortality data. So um, we've done, Tandy has led uh, a large uh, study using mortality data for South Africa um, over 15 or more years. Um, first data set was about 8 million, and it's more than that now. And that's at district municipality level. So while that's very useful, it would be nice to have that at a lower level than district yeah. municipality. So, and, and with that, the, one of the first studies we did, we showed that 3.4% of all deaths 
between, I think it was 1996 and 2013, were associated with either extreme heat or extreme cold. So we have started that work, but we're really in early days. And there's a lot more to do. As I pass the microphone on, what about climate data? Yeah, so in terms of um, climate data, the challenge with working with big health data sets over multiple years, over the whole country, is that you want all of your meteorological station data for all places for all those years, which essentially is 10, 20 years. And as much as it would be wonderful, it's not always possible to get so much data from the data custodians. So then you have to find alternatives, um, whether we use satellite data or other data um, sets, that usually becomes the options. Thanks. Just wanted to peg that on two is in the room. <laughs> um, okay, my label, please. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Kennedy. Thank you for such a very nice um, presentation. Um, one of the questions that I wanted to ask in response uh, is related to um, data and um, um, accessibility and the kind of format that uh, we receive the data, uh, especially in the health outcomes. Like it really um, delays or it's a, it's, a, it's a struggle for some people or for some students uh, in public health as much of, many of them are not uh, really familiar with, you know, uh, statistics and all that. And I also wanted to comment about uh, the need for additional research and what you mentioned that um, other research areas like um, cross-sectional studies are closed. But I think um, it's it all boils back to uh, capacity buildings. Yeah. So um, I think yes, um, concepts like uh, reach uh, it will expose um, those that are interested in climate and health related um, studies uh, to experts that can or even if they are willing to train like you know the maybe researchers. So yeah. Thank you. Um, just quickly, I want to point out we are 12 o'clock, so we've got Zine and Machu. I can't take yours now. Sorry. Uh, but uh, let's have a very brief question, please, uh, from the group. Do you want to answer that? I'd just say that yes, getting health data is very difficult. We collated uh, data sets over 15 years or something from two hospitals in the pipeline. It probably took about two years to because it was all handwritten so it took about two years with a team of people to make that um electronic and that would cost a fortune um so yeah and then the other thing is i have said i don't support cross-sectional studies but at the same time i see great value in politics of work and so i think if we're going to do epidemiology it should be multi part um, and uh, um, mixed methods approach. And I think there's great value in politics. Can we, can we take what Julia has any questions and then you ask them both? No, I'm afraid to have to move on from there. So, first thing to that one is. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for your presentation. Um, asking my question from the layman's point of view, it's just, it's just to, um, not to congratulate, but to indicate that I'm happy that finally. Um, how the impact of relativity uh, health is fully getting into the Western agenda in the past, the focus has always been on the oceans and just and just but very little, in my view, has been done around the impact of global warming in the health. Secondly, my question is um, we think the, these bouts of uh, diseases that we don't yet uh, conquer, like the mineral. Output, output. And I'm just uh, wondering is there a link to global warming? If yes, what, what, are, what are the prospects that in the future are moving forward due to global warming? We might find ourselves not being able to treat every those diseases with the conventional conventional medicine that we used before, or maybe need some more resistance to what we have been using. Thank you. 
I think that's a, oh, I was going to answer two. No, go ahead. Okay, I think that's a wonderful point. Thanks for mentioning the good work that everyone's doing on health. I think you are making great progress, although you still have a lot to do. And um, yeah, so I can't speak to measles because I haven't done working measles, but I can speak to COVID and SARS cov too. And that's a classic example. So climate change is not necessarily the main reason why we saw SARS cov 2. Uh, but the change in the environment, which may be caused to, to temperature, which changed where things were interacting with people, whether it was animals or whatever they decided it was, we're going to see more and more of that in the future. And so these sorts of infectious diseases are going to come, come out into society, and we're not going to necessarily know what to do with them and how to treat them. But it's very likely that we will see more of that in the future. Yeah. Oh, it's a quick one. I know we have the extra time here, but that's okay. We just take a little bit of lunch. Uh, it's worth fun. So, uh, thanks for the talk. I was wondering if maybe on a more local scale, or just you had case studies where the wellness and the health of people have improved due to climate-related um, factors, because I think that we see more climate change than with the global warming, but sometimes when we look at the local scale, it's different. Some people with an increase in temperature and others with a different kind of change. Yeah, I can only answer that very briefly and say that there may be a slight benefit in if there are warmer winters, people may not go warm, in which case they would be exposed to less air pollution. But I don't know if we have evidence to solve that. Harry, thank you very, very much. Uh, Hopefully, we'll have more opportunities to talk as well. Okay, so uh, we've got three presentations now before lunch. Um, we've got Christian, and then we've got Aliza, and then we've got Patrick. Uh, and so let's proceed, please. So, Christian, thank you very much. Christian from uh, Stellenbosch University and is at the medical school, but also works at the private school. Right? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, yes. Thanks very much. Um, I think um, Dr. Karagi, uh, I need to call her Ms. Karagi, <laughs> she was my co supervisor. So she responded to the question of, uh, um, I mean, uh, part, uh, she responded partly to the question of Mark uh, 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 Mbe. Um, I, I mean, in terms of uh, case, uh, case study and evidence from, from, from the local uh, area, uh, I think uh, with my, my presentation, I'll tackle uh, a bit of that aspect of the company of formal health care, the impact of family change on formal health care. And then when we see uh, some, some issues of uh, like uh, uh, disaster uh, uh, management or uh, I mean, uh, with, a, with a event, uh, the case of course, of course, natal uh, uh, bomb rain, and how the climate, I mean, formal health care has responded to that. So we, we saw some, some of the cases like that. So, um, I think uh, Dr. Karaj said everything that when we talk the impact of climate change, it's a direct impact. Uh, we have indirect impact, uh, but oh, sorry, we have direct impact, we have uh, uh, indirect impact, but we also have the impact on the health services. She also talked about it, so <laughs> I'm, I'm quite covered for my background. There is no need of going there, but climate change is just uh, one of the uh, ecological drivers that uh, uh, lead to uh, health effects. But um, uh, the issue is here is kind of study that we are doing, no more cross-sectional cross study, but kind of study that we are doing to uh, to come up with uh, evidence on, on uh, climate health effects. So uh, that comes with uh, associating different uh, mediating factors that are really important to understand the effect of climate change uh, uh, on health. So when we talk, uh, our climate change, sorry, when we talk how climate change uh, affects health, so we have uh, different aspects. It was also a bit covered, so it, 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 it's similar to event through infection disease, waterborne disease, mental health, through its, uh, its stress, with, through air pollution. So uh, different kind of interaction with uh, uh, close interaction with, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, animal that not only tackle the issue of climate change, but uh, tackle the issue of biodiversity. So we, we need also to consider that, but when we talk about climate change, so the impact on the drought, on flower, 
lead to people displacement, lead to uh, 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 the flood, so climate change lead to flood, lead to, uh, lead to uh, drought. This impact indirectly to, um, uh, I mean, uh, human uh, health and well being. So we're talking the case of climate change, uh, uh, climate migration. So as, as some people today are moving because of their area being uh, affected by drought, so they prefer to move. But as they're moving, we also uh, they, there is a, an underlying question on where they're going. They, they're going to meet another area with the, a, a certain health system setting. Are they uh, prepared? Uh, is, uh, the, the health set, uh, the, 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 the primary health care or the health system on the other side, is that prepared to receive this crowd of people to come and be attended in the hospital? This is also another issue of crowding people in the waiting area because they're coming from other, uh, other provinces. So it's become a, a huge problem for health system uh, to, to incorporate, uh, uh, I mean, people dis displacement in, uh, in terms of the health services. So they are direct uh, effect of climate change. Of course, when it, it's a, a heat wave, it is easy to get that uh, we, we have the uh, uh, hypothermia. So uh, uh, it's, it's not about talking about the, the direct effect of climate change, but uh, uh, we, you can get some. So the, another effect of climate change, besides the uh, indirect and uh, direct, with which tackle mostly the public health uh, effect of climate change. But we also need to look at the health sector's impact of climate change. Look at this picture. When it's raining and the, the hospital is like under the flood, our doctor will give service to, uh, to the patient in that issue. But at the same time, people, the patients who are there in that hospital can easily get cholera, can be, they are exposed to different diseases. So we are also seeing that climate change is not only impacting. The, I mean, human health and well being outside the hospital, don't so they come, but inside the hospital, it's already a huge problem. This is a niche area for climate uh, uh, education, climate study. So that's what uh, we, we are talking about. So after the flood of Deben, we have noticed kind of, uh, a, a little bit of people coming to the hospital because of uh, diarrhea, different uh, issues. But uh, the, 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 the problem was. The health system, the, the, the capacity of primary health care in KwaZulu Natal wasn't ready to receive, I mean, to deal with this with this, with, uh, this task. So that was a huge problem. So when we talk about uh, climate change research, we have uh, in this uh, uh, framework, we have like three aspects. We have the, the impact of climate change on health services. We have the impact of climate change on health of the community not on the public, the public aspect, but the community at the local area. But we have also the impact of health service in the climate change. Health service itself also is a leading cause of like, uh, 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 I mean, air pollution, uh, soil pollution, and uh, contributing uh, to uh, carbon footprint. So this is also a problem. So when we think of research on climate change, we have to think how we can make more global green healthy hospital. So by cutting the footprint of the carbon footprint of the hospital, we are contributing to the research on climate change, uh, on uh, the impact of climate change on health. So research can be in, in twofold, creating resilience of health services and community and providing providing health without harm. So that's what I said. But so we are saying today that these are the three aspects of, of research that we really need to, to combine or we need to, to find a way to bring evidence-based uh, research that can help the policymakers to come up with a good policy that help can change the situation of the people on the ground. Climate change is really a health emergency today. So we need to do something. It's not something that we can see from far. So climate scientists, we need you to give us clear, clear evidence on our, uh, uh, on the I mean uh, like weather weather events or climate event. I would like to take it that aspect, taking uh, uh, more years uh, 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 of collecting data of uh, weather events. So we come to climate event. We need to have clear evidence on that for us to to come to, to do also clear uh, uh, association uh, research of implication of the clinical aspect of them. But we have noticed that in Africa, especially, there is quite a lack of study around 
climate change and primary health care. Climate change and health services. I would like to put it like health services, but I'm tackling only the aspect of, of primary health care. So we conducted a scoping review. Because we, we don't like, we have to start by a scoping review to have an idea of what are the evidence there, what are the researches, the, 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 what, what are the researches done in this area that can help us to discover different knowledge gaps that from where we can tackle different aspects of research. So we selected PubMed. From PubMed, we got uh, 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 the number of citations so that we can see there in the video. We got uh, uh, Scopus, CINAHL, uh, we have Web of Science, and uh, University uh, Repository Data. So University Repository Data, we tackle all the publications, like uh, masters and we only masters and uh, uh, PhDs dissertation uh, that would, maybe they couldn't be published, like published like in the journal, maybe they become with the paper, but uh, it's still published in the university website. So we thought we pick those one to find if there are some research on climate change effect on primary healthcare in Africa. So uh, among the university, uh, our strategies were to pick the two best university in Africa, regionally. Two best university in Southern Africa, two best university in Northern Africa, uh, in Eastern Africa, Western Africa, Central Africa. We are best by uh, the uh, a world, world university ranking. So 2000, 2020, that, that guide us to come up with uh, some university. So uh, in, uh, in, in, in the Southern Africa, we got uh, VIT and uh, UCT. So that was the best university where we collected some, some data and there are also different universities in other uh, reg regions of Africa. So actually, we, we selected 1,242 uh, uh, papers. From there, we start now, apply, we applied our exclusion and uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria that I'll show you. And we start, uh, um, I mean, uh, putting away some of the, the, the studies that were not uh, important for us. And we come up with uh, 12 papers only. So from, 2010 till 2021. So 10 years, we could only come up with 12 papers. That's showing clearly that the area is really under research, that there is no much research done on that aspect. So it becomes quite difficult for us to give evidence to the policymakers on the health sectors to lead the, primary, the health system on how to tackle the issue of primary health care uh, on the ground, on the community based, or, or uh, uh, on the in the hospital issue of uh, waiting area, as Professor uh, Doctor Karim, Professor Karim accepted that because <laughs> yeah, so we, we, it's not easy to come to, to I mean to inform the policymakers that uh, uh, they have to do something for uh, the patients out the, 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 the crowd of patients in the hospital. So it's it's not quite easy. They, they don't have evidence. They don't have much evidence on uh, what to say. So it, uh, as, as some of them are also scientific, not only the politicians, but they, they, they are hesitating. So I always say of uh, policy hesitance on the, in the area of climate change and health. These are the reasons, some of the reasons so we don't have, we as scientific, uh, uh, as scientists in the health sector, climate change health sector, we may be not coming up with strong evidence that can help them to tackle the issue. Our include inclusion and exclusion criteria were based on the population, the concept, the outcome, the study design, and the time period. Language, but uh, uh, important here, we included three languages because we thought in Africa, there are many languages, but publishing languages, it's mostly English. And this is the best, English, we get more papers in English. Even those who are in the country where they're speaking, they don't, they are not speaking English, but you get uh, papers in English. You get papers in French, 
and uh, I was uh, the, the, the person uh, uh, doing the translation and reading and picking up what because I'm a French guy. So, <laughs> so we had people from uh, different different parts. So there is there is and Portuguese from Mozambique. We got two two publications from Mozambique in Portuguese and then we're quite surprised. <laughs> so. These are the, the languages. Why we have to include this? Because we want we, we are born in bias. Because if we exclude the French, we exclude the Portuguese, we it's possible that we not be we, we, we are not comprehensive enough. So uh, the outcome, the evidence on uh, the relationship in climate change. So the include outcome related to climate change impact, to climate change adaptation, climate change resilience, resilience and the mitigation. We included the three aspects. Okay. So there is the, the, the mitigation, resilience, and uh, 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 mitigation, resilience, and adaptation. Okay. So the, our search term were guided by climate change. We had to be search term, climate change and trauma care. Okay? And uh, we, we, we get like a synonym of the, of, uh, of the not really synonym, but the applications of this text them in other uh, in different uh, studies. So global warming for climate change, greenhouse gases, environmental harm, pollution, and trauma care. They are with like trauma care, primary care, district health services, district health system. They try to inform us. So uh, in terms of the result, descriptive results showing that this is just the frequency of this of application. So it's a bit coming up that from twenty. To 2020, uh, we are we saw quite increase of numbers of people among the 12. Unfortunately, it's not that easy to uh, pick the message from these figures. So, countries uh, among the countries: Ghana, Nigeria, South Africa, Sudan, Uganda, and uh, uh, I mean uh, the uh, low and middle income countries in general, because there were some publications that like, so just uh, say low and middle income countries without specifying which countries. They so, uh, but in that, uh, we pick up that they're talking about Africa. So that was also part of the, our selection. So well, you will notice Ghana was, we had more publications in Ghana and coming to uh, uh, the, the bigger part of uh, low and middle income countries in Africa. So the literature review was the most uh, the study design that was uh, conducted for, for this issue, which is not really uh, what is that uh, informative enough. Okay, so out of the three questions that we ask, how climate change impacted health and primary health care services delivered in Africa? You get the, but, uh, uh, many, uh, uh, I mean, out of the 12, they responded that it's impacting on malnutrition food institutes. Infectious disease, extremely, uh, Dr. Uh, Karagi, uh, Professor Karagi had said that, uh, extreme heat, uh, injury, and trauma in nutrition cells. So, out of the second question, how has primary healthcare system mitigated its own contribution to climate change? Remember, I told you about the thing, uh, care without harm. So, about decreasing the food, uh, uh, the carbon footprint of different hospitals in contributing to the issue of climate change. One study only talked about uh, using both the energy, the renewable energy, and uh, 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 um, the, I mean, diesel energy. So they were doing, they were using both. They were in 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 Chad, yes. So uh, the third question was on the primary. The has the primary healthcare system adapted to the threat of climate change? So there are also some uh, area where they are adapting, strengthening primary healthcare system, creating new indicators. Professor Karaja said that I'm quite happy that I will, I will try to, to understand about uh, what Rich is doing in raising the indicators because you know, we come up with that question as a niche area. So and uh, strength, strengthening multi-sector collaboration to come up with uh, multidisciplinary uh, 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 research and uh, education. He talked about climate change education, which is very important. Doctors, I'm teaching in uh, medicine. So it's not easy to, to, to explain to the student that uh, climate change is has impact on the patient when they go to the patient. They not uh, really seeing that effect directly. So they need to understand this. And we have to develop the infrastructure coming up. So these questions were also asked 
by different uh, stakeholders of uh, WHO, World Health Organization. So the response to that, uh, the World Health Organization since uh, uh, 2020, they come up with uh, an operational framework to uh, solve the issue of uh, climate disease and trauma health care. So this figure showing the inner circle with the building blocks of health system, finance, service delivery, leadership, and those building blocks need to be uh, like, uh, we have to find a way to incorporate the climate change issues by coming up with the second circle on leadership, governance, health workers, vulnerability, and all, all so you can read it. So now we try to match our results into this figure of operational framework, because how we should operate in, in, uh, in South Africa. But considering that in the, the, uh, the upper circle, that the, the results can show clearly that when we talk about the leadership in the issue of uh, climate change and primary health care, there is no evidence, there is no study that's showing something. When we talk about the climate change and health financing, there is no evidence. So these are different areas that can lead to different research. So that comes with many questions, implications that we raised many questions as uh, to help us as the, the, the knowledge gap. The knowledge gap, how we can cover those knowledge gap by raising these questions for future research. So we are conducting this research with uh, the Prima Farmed. Prima Farmed is uh, an organization of uh, medical doctors, African medical doctors, all together discussing the issue of primary health care. And uh, we are now bringing the, the impact of climate change in primary health care. So, Good that they are not to come as co authors and want to really this research. So, uh, in conclusion, I would just want to say that this the problem is really quite huge. We really need to think about it. When we think about climate change, it's not only about its implication on agriculture. Knowing that the implication on agriculture is telling you that there will be an impact on human health and well being. As, as uh, an outcome. So give us good, uh, we need a good interaction with the climate, climate scientists for us to, to come up with a good conclusion. The rest, I think you can read it as conclusion. Thanks very much. Thank you, Bert. Um, um, I wanted to push along, but I do want to say a very question. Okay, let's take one, please. You missed that last one, so you get the chance this time. So you were talking about how the, the students at the Washington Organ especially the doctor students, are not too much aware of how they can like incorporate climate change. So at which you have something called climate change in you, where every single first year student, no matter what field you're in, no matter what course you do, has to take and has to have like a, a three-week course for orientation meeting that teaches them about what climate change is. Implementation and the various sectors that implement it by climate change effects. Do you think something like this would work if it's implemented across all universities in Africa and Africa? Yeah, yeah, I think it's it's work because we have started already. I'm teaching planetary health in uh Stellenbosch. We have started there, and uh, we went to uh, uh Malawi for uh, I mean the workshop, and I was surprised that uh, I got many emails, even from people people from London. Requesting the, the materials that we are building. I'm collaborating with uh, Wonka uh, uh, World, this is uh, the family physicians worldwide coming together. And we think that it's important for them to understand the issue of climate change in, uh, in primary health care. So they are also requesting the materials that we are building. I made a third module and already, going to the fourth module already by. by um, April, I'll teach the, the fourth module. So this is, it's, it's teachable, and we are insisting on area of like bioclimatology. So showing the link in one of my slides, I show hypothermia, how heat wave is, is really affecting the temperature of the body and leading to cardiovascular disease, so for example, or how it's affecting, uh, uh, um, I mean, uh, an environment leading to a respiratory disease. So these are the questions, and worldwide today there is planetary health for clinicians. It's a worldwide movement. 
where the clinicians themselves, they are finding a way to justify the impact of climate change in the disease in the patient. Thank you very much. I'm sorry we can't carry on this conversation. There's obviously more to say that came this afternoon. So I'm going to move over to Alisa, who is uh, a local almost, uh, and um, is uh, moving on to the infectious disease side of things with your presentation. Thanks. Okay, th uh, thanks, Neville. I, I, I was very happy to be included in this session, although I'm not a climate scientist or a health scientist. I'm a behavioral ecologist and I study small carnivores, but I think uh, it will become clear why I'm here. Uh, um, and the study is um, a review as well, basically, um, in which I found a lot of nothing. So I would really like some input and feedback on um, maybe I'm missing something, maybe these gaps are real, which I think is what's the, what, what, yeah, what I believe is happening. So the current reality that we're facing is that our relationship with nature is changing, right? And this is uh, because of global change. So not just the, the climate, the weather, uh, the, our consumption patterns are changing. Our agriculture, our land use uh, patterns are all changing. Um, we are facing uh, mass biodiversity losses at all uh, levels, um, from insects to mega herbivores. Um, and amidst this, uh, we are also experiencing an increase in zoonotic disease outbreaks. Now, I'm preaching to the choir, I'm sure, but zoonoses are, are those pathogens that start up in animal hosts, get transferred or transmitted to humans, and then um, if there's an outbreak, it's because we are also susceptible to these pathogens. Now, the reason I started to do this uh, review, basically, was that a recent paper by Bernstein et al. showed what we all suspect, uh, that the cost of responding to a zoonotic disease outbreak is incredibly high. Uh, and this is not just in terms of lives lost, but in terms of dollars, the dollar cost. And this same um, paper showed that if we invested the money and the research effort and so on in preventing the outbreak from occurring in the first place, we would not only save lives, but quite a bit of money. This makes intuitive sense to me. And uh, the concept is probably not new because as, again, I'm preaching to the choir, as people here probably know, we have been, um, uh, we have formulated the One Health concept, which is also applied in Africa now, which basically says that human health is inextricably linked to environmental health and to animal health. Um, and unfortunately, despite uh, what Christians showed that there's a lack of research, what uh, currently showed there's a lack of research, most of our research effort is still concentrated uh, in the human health sector because we are humans and therefore selfish, and we do not do the same amount of financing and effort in terms of environmental health or animal health. And now, post-pandemic, we did start throwing more money and time and effort I'm looking at animal health and we are really focusing on the bats. I'm not saying we should not focus on bats. What I'm trying to show with this talk here is that we have some blind spots. Now, let's just take a step back. When it comes to this monotic disease spillover happening between the animals, the wildlife hosts and humans, there are no steps to pathogen spillover. In the first place, the pathogen must be circulating in the host population to a certain level. It, it can't just be present in small quantities. It must be there uh, in biologically meaningful amounts. Uh, and after that, humans need to get exposed to this pathogen. Um, and whether we get exposed by eating the animals, by being bitten by the animals, uh, getting stung by vectors, there are lots of different uh, possibilities for us to be exposed. And then finally, once humans do get exposed to this pathogen, uh, our susceptibility might be low. We may, just one or two people might be infected and it stops there. That is not a zoonotic disease outbreak. However, if uh, a lot of us are actually susceptible, we get um, localized outbreaks, you get uh, uh, epidemics, or as we've experienced, a pandemic. And we, despite what you may think of how we handle COVID, uh, we, we have a bit of a handle on step three, on responding once the outbreak is there. 
what we have almost no knowledge about is step one and step two. We, it's, it's, it's generally a massive blind spot. And now I'm a carnivore, amongst other things, I study small carnivores, and I want to just paint the picture here. So small carnivores are carnivores that are less than 21 and a half kgs. They're the foxes, the mongoose, uh, servals, and so forth. They are key to most food webs, and they're very widespread. Uh, they perform essential ecosystem services, as you may imagine. They eat rodents, they eat insects, all the little critters. Um, and they actually very often thrive under the conditions of a changing world because we as humans, we tend to kill the large predators, the lions, the wolves. And when that happens, there's meso predator release. These guys are the meso predators, the, the in between predators. They have no more competition from the top down. Their numbers just increase, they thrive. Most of these small carnivores we don't view as a threat to ourselves, and they're not. Um, so we don't actively hunt them out, uh, kill them like you would with, with rodents or so. So actually, small carnivores thrive under the changing um, global, uh, under the global change conditions. Um, and a recent paper by Courtney Marmowick and her colleagues uh, showed that really carnivores, small carnivores, specifically the small ones, they are widespread and we can use them as excellent sentinels of global change because they are flexible, they are adaptable, their social systems change uh, depending on um, whether they're on a farm or, or in a completely pristine environment. Their, uh, their diets can change, they are super adaptable, and uh, we can really use them if we focus a little bit more research effort on them, uh, which is, uh, Mar Marnowick and colleagues, they basically argue that you're missing little out of ecology. And what I want to emphasize to this choir here is they do carry diseases. Of course they do, which species do not. However, <laughs> sadly, when you look at zoonoses, and this is based now on a study by Han et al. pre-pandemic, if you can remember those times, <laughs> um, carnivores, this is now generally carnivores, large and small, are prominent hosts of zoonotic pathogens. In fact, looking at this little uh, graph here, you can see carnivores outstrip the bats, which are the big boogeymen right now, as well as primates in terms of how many zoonotic pathogens they carry. This includes coronavirus. Um, and the very small number of studies that I could find done in Africa on small carnivores show when they look at the foxes, whether they have coronavirus. Oh yes, there's quite high zero prevalence. So, the species are increasing, they live with us, they live among us, we interact. I mean, on our farms, on our, in our rural areas, you find a lot of small carnivores. I mean, I've had a genet on my strip numerous times. Um, they, they definitely interact with our domestic species, the cattle, the sheep, and so on. Um, we persecute them. So black-backed jackals are small carnivores, even though we think of them as larger. I mean, we try, we are actively trying to hunt them to extinction on, on commercial farms. Uh, we, we drive over them. Like if you look at the patterns of roadkill across the country, this is a study in which I was involved. Um, we we find bat foxes, yellow mongoose, and black-backed jackals, small carnivores, always amongst the top three animals that we just drive over. So this is a passive persecution. Uh, and we use them, we have we use them for cultural purposes too. And this is especially the spotted animals, the, the genets, the servals, their fur, the coats are beautiful, very spotted, looks like little leopards. They are getting hunted and uh, for, for, for use to look, you know, for their fur. We find them in markets. So again, there's not a lot of research that I could find um, published. They're just documents what's happening at um wildlife markets, if you look at South Africa, but gemmets, polecats, black bag jackals, serval, mongoose, uh, most of the other mongoose, they keep showing up in these different marketplaces. But again, the research is, is fairly limited. So even though in South Africa particularly, we don't really have a big bush meat industry, uh, we certainly do ingest or use them as well. So, 
given that the interact, given that they are not going to go away under climate change like many, many other species are, do we know what risks these guys pose, these small carnivores? So this was a difficult part for me because I, I looked using Google Scholar and uh, I found very little until it was just plain zoonotic disease and small carnivores. I didn't find much. So I tried to focus on um, the diseases I found recently identified in 2021 as the research priorities for control of zoonoses in South Africa. Uh, this study, uh, basically, they interviewed experts to find out what are the most troubling diseases that we should be focusing on. And these are rabies, tuberculosis, uh, brucellosis, Rift Valley fever, and cystic And I'm sure they are probably more very common in diseases, but I have to start somewhere. Now, these diseases are uh, most likely the, the top five because, for example, rabies is highly fatal. Uh, tuberculosis, similarly, uh, things like cystic sarcosis, tapeworm, it's not necessarily fatal, but it, it really has a lot of health effect, impacts. It's significantly linked to epilepsy and so on. So I can see why these diseases were chosen. And now if we look at small carnivores, what have we looked whether or not say tuberculosis occurs in small carnivores in Africa, specifically South Africa. This is what I tried to search for. I did not look at feces. I'm going to look at masters and PhD theses after this. I was <sighs> sad to find that, for example, with brucellosis, rift valley fever, I found nothing, not, not a single paper. Uh, cystic sarcosis. I found three studies done in Tunisia on jackals and foxes showing that cystic sarcosis was happening, occurred in the samples that they tested. Tuberculosis has been studied in one population of meerkats in South Africa and in a population of banded mongoose in Botswana. That's it. Rabies, now rabies is well studied because rabies is a multi-host, very dangerous pathogen. This virus, we have vaccination campaigns, et cetera, et cetera. However, we have what happens with rabies in the wildlife populations before an outbreak occurs, all of the research on rabies is post-mortem. So, and this is because once, you know, it, it's very difficult to get positive um, identification of rabies in a live animal, you tend to need um, neural tissue, a brain sample, right? But we don't know how these wild animals maintain these cycles of, of rabies. We don't know this yet. And these days, I mean, there's some evidence that there's, uh, aborted rabies infections, which you can test for through serum, through blood serum. So the potential there is there to study them before there's an outbreak. But that's it. We know something about rabies. So I'm not trying to scare you because I love these guys. Uh, small carnivores are essential. We should not be going to errat out to eradicate them all now. And you'll see in my next slide, biodiversity buffers us against disease. We need to maintain our biodiversity. But you could see those large research gaps, right? It's crickets. There's nothing known about these diseases. And despite the fact that zoonotic diseases, the, the outbreaks are on the increase, we have yet to predict an outbreak accurately, right? We said, oh, it's going to happen in Asia somewhere. Oh, it's going to happen in Africa somewhere. So if we were able to monitor better, we would be able to form better predictions. Perhaps we can even prevent an outbreak. This is one of those fantastical scenarios that we heard about today in the keynote. Um, and I, I think there's a lot of room for research here, um, especially if you think of what next generation sequencing is opening up these days, uh, collecting fecal samples, you can do entire virome and microbiome analyses. And, as an ecologist, I can tell you we love fecal samples. That is our bread and butter <laughs> on, on a certain level. <laughs> but we already collect the data. A lot of ecologists are out there already collecting blood samples and all of these samples. So shouldn't there be an incentive by, say, the big funders, the same way they're trying to incentivize us to do science engagement? Here is 30,000 engaged somehow. Couldn't they give us 30,000 to just here, collect a couple of tubes, send it to this lab, it'll be monitored. It doesn't have to be related to your research. Just 
give us half your food, basically, right? We could be monitoring, and we should be monitoring. And wildlife markets, there is no checking what's happening with the uh, pathogen in, in, in those um, samples there. We need to check. Um, and we need to understand the vaccine disease cycles, the wildlife cycles better. Otherwise, we're never going to get a handle on this. We're always going to be reactive. We're always going to point out how little we know about the human health aspect. Whereas, again, you know, it was nothing. And look, these are adorable, wonderful, caring, flexible creatures. We should be keeping them and studying them. <clears throat> Thank you. That is my talk. I think yeah. it's. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for a very interesting introduction. Um, and it's really an area. Thank you.